And the album of the year is The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill. All right, let's take it back. Yo, remember yeah. back on the bully when cats used to harmonize yeah. like. <laughs> I can think of maybe a handful of performers in my lifetime who were simultaneously as popular and as acclaimed as Lauren Hill. When she broke through in 1996 as part of the Fugees, she was immediately recognized as the standout of the group and a superstar in the making. She more than confirmed those predictions two years later with her landmark solo debut, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. It was a gigantic hit with the public, and an even bigger hit with the critics. She won all the awards. Lauren was fierce, thoughtful, inspiring, and her eclectic blend of hip-hop, R&B, pop, reggae, and folk was so poised and confident that it seemed to predict a long and fruitful career of classic music. And it never came. It could all be so simple. Fans waited patiently for Lauryn Hill to go into the studio so they could hear what other amazing songs she had cooking up. And they waited. And waited. Months became years. Years became decades. And nothing ever materialized. And the lack of output was compounded by rumors of a declining mental state. Reports of instability that never got any better and continue to this day. Lots of great artists have been called crazy, of course, but it's a lot easier for their fans to swallow if they're still being productive. Whatever is going on with Lauren, it crippled her creative drive, very likely permanently. How can I explain myself? I guess it's possible she'll pull a Harper Lee and release a follow-up when she's 80. But until the day that Lauren improbably wanders out of the studio with a finished record, her legacy will have to be restricted to her debut. Miseducation of Lauren Hill. One album. That's all you get. Except... In 2002, with fans ravenous for more Lauren and no new album on the horizon, her label began hyping up the live recording of her performance on MTV's Unplug 2.0 as the official, unofficial follow-up to Miss Education. It is, to date, the only new material Lauren Hill has released in the 20 years since her solo debut. See the road to hell is paved with good intentions. To put it mildly, it did not receive the rapturous acclaim of her first album. In fact, you could more accurately call it a permanent stain on her image, and for reasons that went well beyond the songs. I could sit here and describe the quality of the music, but it wouldn't quite capture that concert. Entertainment Weekly called it baffling on so many levels and the most bizarre follow-up in the history of pop. It didn't just reflect badly on her as an artist, but as a person. Even now, after two decades of erratic behavior, no-show concerts, her ever-extending creative drought, and prison, I don't think there's a single thing that's done more damage to Lauryn Hill's reputation than Unplug 2.0. I don't know, you know, what the press is saying because I don't really listen to the press too much, but I know that, you know, it, the view is I'm like emotionally unstable, which is reality. Like, like you aren't, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a rough one. Lauryn Hill unplugged, uncut, and unprepared to be performing that particular night. Ready or not, this is Train Records. <laughs> So, a couple months ago, Lauryn Hill outraged a whole lot of fans by failing to appear at a scheduled performance. She only performed a half hour set because she showed up two hours late. What? And for me, this was really shocking and dismaying to hear because I really thought that no one was dumb enough in this day and age to buy Lauryn Hill tickets. You're always free to go back and ask for a refund. This is like the billionth time she's done this. She's been showing up late for concerts for 15 years now. You cannot be surprised. What did you think was going to happen? And then, out of curiosity, I looked up some of the performances to see what they were. And, uh... She's great. <laughs> and then it clicked for me. I get it. I get why people still pay money for the off chance that Ms. Lauren Hill might deign to perform for them that night. It's like buying a lotto ticket. You'll probably get nothing, but maybe you'll hit the jackpot. If you catch her on a good night, she kills. And go back and find footage of her in her prime, and you'll see the same thing. She's just an amazing and commanding presence who controls the stage. Which makes what happened that night in 2001 all the more confusing. <laughs> oh, no. Now, I'm inclined to tread lightly here when I talk about this album, because even after all that's gone down, 
the hip hop community is still really fond of and protective of Lauryn Hill, including this album. No one would say it was successful or had a great reception, but it did earn a decent share of fans, including her fellow rapper of unsteady mental health Kanye West, who built one of his first hits out of a sample from this album. And its fans haven't faded with time either. To this day, you'll see people stand up for it and argue for its merits. And you know, it is a singular, unique album, and people genuinely like it for its rawness and its honesty. And God bless him for it, but I don't see who could even dispute that this is one of the worst albums ever made. To me, this is torture. I think it's completely unlistenable. And part of that isn't even Lauren or her music, it's just my personal taste. I don't like MTV Unplugged. It was this big deal in the 90s for some reason, and big stars would roll through, and it had a bunch of high points that everyone remembers, but for the most part, I think these concerts kind of suck. Like, even the good ones, I find I don't really want to listen to that sound for a whole album. Like, the idea is, you know, playing these songs in a small room without amps will make the music more intimate and meaningful. But every time, I'm just thinking, wow, you sure ruined your best songs. It's just a gimmick people took too seriously. And I think the world kind of came around to my side of it, because MTV tried to keep it going in the 2000s with Unplugged 2.0, but it mostly died an unmourned death. They still do it, but no one cares anymore. I think we all gave up on it around the time we heard Korn try to play without pickups or distortion. What the fuck? Not an experiment to be repeated. Of course, ruining your songs is not an issue for Lauren. These are brand new songs. Your fond memories of doo-wop that thing will remain untouched, because she is performing all new, never before released material. A lot of these songs too, some of them, you know, they don't even really have titles yet. All new, unfinished material. If I stop, if I start, if I, you know, feel like saying baby, baby, baby for 18 bars or whatever, you know, I, I just, I do that. All new, unfinished, ad-libbed material. All right, so you guys are cool? Okay, I'm talking to people in my head, too. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be real shaky. And we're going to start things off on a really bitter note. Please don't patronize me, Mr. Intentional. Mr. Intentional is about some unnamed condescending asshole who keeps trying to tell her what to do and keeps bringing her down with his supposed good intentions. Which is not what intentional means, but you know, poetic license. Open up your eyes, Mr. Intentional. It's an odd way to start the performance because it's so sour and angry and probably shocking to fans who are still expecting happy ebullient Lauren from 1998. Yeah, personally I would have maybe saved this for later in the program, but to me that's not the problem. The problem is it's seven minutes. Held emotionally high stage by what everybody does. Seven minutes is a long time to listen to one woman with a guitar. Yeah, it's unplugged, but most unplugged concerts still have a band. The problem was she was dealing with a lawsuit from her band over songwriting credits, so maybe she wanted to prove she could do it without help. But she's actually pretty new to this instrument, and the feel is very... coffee shop open mic night? Take up your bed and walk. I honestly don't know if she could play Wonderwall. And am I wrong, or does her voice sound a little... strained? Stay away from me, Mr. Okay, shaky start, but we're still going. Okay, let's look in the next one. Adam lives in theory. And when I refer to Adam, I'm, I'm really speaking about all of humanity, you know? Yeah, I know what the name Adam symbolizes, Lauren. Okay, Adam lives in theory is about... Adam lives in theory, trying to turn stone into bread. God, more four chord strumming. But I guess the idea is that we focus more on the lyrics. Okay, fine. Here are the lyrics to Adam Lives in Theory. Leaving his descendants <laughs> devices. Oh, Jesus. No, I'm not going through all seven and a half minutes of that. Look, all you need to know you get from the title. It's some heavy-handed allegory about Adam and Eve succumbing to the ills of the world that weigh down all of humanity. 
What's wrong with that, Lauren? Okay, maybe that wasn't what it sounded like. It's not like I can ask her what she meant by that. It's kind of easy to assume the worst, though. You go back and listen to that first album, it's actually kind of preachy and conservative. You can totally imagine Lauren telling teenage boys to pull up their pants and find Jesus. It just didn't come off that way, because the music was so buoyant and uplifting. But this album makes miseducation seem a little worse. Now after the sensation and the empty fornication. She can't recreate Miss Education's vibe on a single guitar, so Lauren the artist as a whole just comes off as really tedious. Another religious song after this one, Oh Jerusalem. Like she even acknowledges that it's going to be quote, cryptic. I know some of it sounds uh, almost cryptic. And she ain't kidding. Cannot bear the fruit of itself except in the vine connected. Cause I'm morally defected by reason of the God inside my head. Yeah, I can't say I'm feeling moved to praise Holy Mount Zion over here. You know, I said that she can't bring back the miseducation vibe on one guitar, but maybe she can't recreate it for a more obvious reason, which is she sounded happy on that album. And unplugged Lauren is not happy. Like, not at all. She's clearly going through something here. And she seems to regard her entire career as complete bullshit. Because it's not reality. I had created this uh, public persona, this public illusion. And that reality thing comes back a lot. Fantasy is what people want, but reality is what they need. And I've just retired from the fantasy part. Like a lot, a lot. In fact, you just talks a lot in general. I used to go on tour, you know, and I'd be a prisoner. I used to be a prisoner on tour because I... This album is a mind-melting hour and 45 minutes, and 30 of them are just her rambling. It's like we all think that the gospel is join a church building, and, and that's deception, you know? The real gospel is... It's agonizing. And especially so for me, because I've already heard most of this word for word from a guy holding a sign on the subway. I should mention that this sat unaired for 10 months before being released in 2002 because 9-11 happened a short time after they recorded this and they wanted to be careful because there's one explicitly political song on here. And what I gotta say is rebel, 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 rebel. She says she worried about releasing it because she didn't want to start riots and violence. I gotta say is rebel. Yeah, don't worry, Lauren. This is not going to inspire anyone to start throwing bricks. It's going to inspire people to get their latte somewhere else. Because, I mean, let's just say it. She sounds like garbage. Apparently, she blew her voice out in rehearsal the night before. And instead of rescheduling, which I'm sure MTV would have understood because these things happen, she just decided the show must go on. Are you satisfied? Yes, the woman who is infamous for constantly failing to appear on stage when she doesn't feel up to it. On a night where she sounded like Joan Rivers with the flu. For a performance that was going to be aired on national TV. And where her only accompaniment was an instrument she only had basic skills on. So the show was going to live and die off the strength of her voice. This was the date she decided she was going to make. <laughs> While the first few songs are all pretty bad amateurish even. There are a couple songs on here I think are close to done and would be good in a real concert or a real album, but we are definitely hearing the worst possible version of them. Just want you and to be clear, she knows what she sounds like, and she has a justification for doing this. Wait for it. I know I sound raspy, but that's, hey, you know, reality is sometimes I stay up late, and this is what I sound like when I wake up the next day. It's reality. You know, I just sound like a singer with a lot of stuff in the throat. I'm not sucking, I'm being real. That's her excuse for this self-indulgent ramshackle performance. Like the songs aren't finished. Yeah. See, well, 
what key I want to do this in. She flubs them several times. I could care less if you're upset. So you don't change the truth. Even the titles aren't locked down. MTV gives different names for them than the CD does. I remember. This is the equivalent of when a big comedian does an unannounced set in a small club to work out new jokes, only it's a giant Netflix special at the same time. And I gotta be honest, her justification sounds a lot like the pretensions of the Unplugged series itself, taken to its dumbest conclusion. Performing in a small intimate room is more real. Performing on acoustic instruments is real. These traditions are alive, Performing when your voice is gone is real. Performing unfinished songs you can't perform right is real. Showing up drunk and puking on stage is real. No, Unplugged is just a style, to be used well or used badly just like any other style. It's not more authentic than a 40-piece band, and a hoarse, raspy vocal isn't more real than a polished one. It's still artificial, it's still a presentation. This is so basic I shouldn't have to say it. It's still performance. I used to be a performer, and I, I really don't consider myself a performer so much anymore. I really just... Then what the hell am I watching, lady? Yeah. And the outfit. We gotta talk about the outfit. I mean, look at what she's wearing. Just look at it. They keep talking, cause none of them walking. <laughs> yeah, I, I have nothing to say about the outfit. Looks like a normal outfit to me. I don't think we need to talk about it one bit. It's just that Lauren thinks we do. It's the first thing she talks about, in fact. I used to get dressed for y'all now. I don't do that no more. I'm sorry. It's, it's a new day. What are you apologizing for? It's an unplugged session. No one's expecting you to come out looking like Lady Gaga. But she goes on and on about how she picked this outfit. So I pull out all these clothes and I'm saying, okay, bro, well, you know. But she clearly spent a lot of time trying to look just the right level of casual. Because it is, say it with me now. It's not, it's not even that, you know, it's, but this is reality. This is, you know. Reality. So people need to see the reality. They need to see. She's being real. Reality is good because that means everybody can just. Really real. And I'm saying just give them reality from the door because see. Realer than show. real deal Holyfield. Jennifer Lopez wasn't this real. Like I said, it's, it's reality, so. But y'all got, I think y'all got that by now. Ha ha ha, yup. Like, I don't want to act like Polish is the be-all, end-all, but she's not being raw like this to enhance her performance. She's just being lazy. These songs aren't reality either. It's all impenetrable, unrelatable generalities. It comes off like a parody of conscious hip-hop with all the Bob Marleyisms and spirituality ragged and ugly and tired. People praise this album for being honest. I don't think it's honest at all. In fact, I would call it delusional. What I realize I'm, I've become is one of those mad scientists who, who does the test on themselves first, you see, to make sure that they work. And that's when you know, okay, look, I got something that works, you know. She presents it like she's come out the other side with all this wisdom, like she has the right to lecture, but she's really obviously still struggling and confused. If this were really honest, she'd be using words like anxiety or depression, but instead she's got a bunch of confusing sermons that all boil down to be real, whatever that means. Gotta find peace of mind. See, this is what that voice in your head says when you try to get peace of mind. There is one song on here that does come off as honest, which is I Gotta Find Peace of Mind. Because, you know, she does gotta find peace of mind. That's true enough. But it's actually not the lyrics that are emotionally honest. Those are actually kind of muddled. It's more what happens towards the end, where she straight has an emotional breakdown during it. You're my peace of mind. Oh boy, here we go. Well, you know, she kept talking about reality. That's certainly something that happens in reality. Someone you care about has just been dealing with too much, starts breaking down in front of you. And in those situations, I always do my best to be sympathetic and compassionately help them out of my apartment and into a cab so they can go find someone who can deal with that because I, I, I can't, I cannot. Merciful, merciful. So Lauren breaking down like this, this doesn't capture some deep truth to me. It's just really uncomfortable. Her crying, plus all the disjointed rambling, plus everything we know about her in hindsight, she's clearly not doing well, and I feel like I shouldn't be seeing this. In fact, I honestly kind of feel bad that I'm doing this video at all. Like, <laughs> you know, watch some YouTube dick make fun of a woman's emotional problems for 20 minutes. Her, her. That said, 
I, I do think this is still fair game because so many people still insist that the Emperor still has clothes on. Even though she's up there almost oozing contempt for art in general and certainly for the listener. Y'all getting paid to clap like this? Fuck you for clapping. She's just browbeating and bullying the entire night. Y'all doing all right? I'm screaming at you. I'm just asking a question. Y'all giving me a clap. I'm like, a yes is fine. <laughs> Fuck you again for clapping. That's how disc two in the set starts off. And this interlude goes on for a butt-numbing 12 straight minutes. Welcome to Lauren Hill TED Talks. Get comfy. The description of the Bible says we, we, uh, we, what does it say? Uh, Why not just cut this? Say we appreciate the opportunity to be alive, you know? And I'm just, I'm glad that I, I understand that it was because I was measuring myself or, or trying to compare myself to a standard that wasn't reality. It wasn't the standard at all. Okay, geez, finally. One time, I, it, it came to me. Uh, Y'all never knew me. I want to introduce you to me. I'm just getting to know me. Ma'am, this is an Arby's. They've got so much things to say. We end with a Bob Marley song, and a song that sounds like it's trying to be a Bob Marley song. By that point, her voice is completely gone. I, I know this album has Defenders, but it's so long. So uncomfortable, so one note, so monotonous, so embarrassing. Maybe one raspy song could have been acceptable, but an hour 45? No. Is anything on it salvageable? I don't know, maybe. Like, you can hear things that might sound good when she releases the finished versions on that next album. Oh, wait. Honestly, I suspect Kanye found the only decent 10 seconds in the whole concert. MTV should have just buried this. In the aftermath, record executives admitted that they wanted to jump out a window listening to it, and that a lesser artist wouldn't have ever gotten this released. But why not cut out all the rambling at least? I think they left it in because they had to break up the monotony of her plonking on her six string, but they could still cut it down a little. I think they released it uncut because the only way it's interesting is if it was just the full unvarnished portrait of Lauren being a mess. And that feels really gross to me. Like, I realize I'm not taking down a sacred cow here, but I don't feel like it's unnecessary either. We'll be starting that one again. If this were a CD from someone you'd never heard of, you'd demand your money back. These are unfinished, unreleasable songs with no hooks that all sound the goddamn same, sung badly, played badly, intercut with interminable disjointed lecturing, and the only reason people defend it is because she's fucking losing her shit during it. This isn't us witnessing a raw genius performance, it's just rubbernecking. All I see is a record company trying to squeeze more money out of a presumed cash cow that suddenly went dry. And it's especially sad because we know it never gets any better for her. She doesn't find peace, she doesn't cut a new album. And watching this I just felt like an enabler. And being forced to listen to this I also felt insulted by her personally. Killing us softly with her songs indeed. Freedom, freedom time y'all. Freedom time y'all. Freedom time, get free. So if, you, if you give yourself up, listen, nobody can black. Oh my god, she's still going. No, no, we're done. The end.